That is a great sound, isn't it? Why don't you love that song? That was powerful. We are continuing in 1 John. We're in chapter 5, so if you have a Bible or a phone, you might want to look in 1 John 5. And as we get started, let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for letting us get together and worship freely, allowing us to sing praises to your name, to be encouraged by hearing your praises sung by others. Thank you for the powerful messages in our songs. We pray now that you would open your word to us. Uh, Father, in spite of me, speak to us through your word, I pray in your name. Amen. Standing before the student body of King's College in London in 1944, C.S. Lewis gave one of his most profound speeches entitled, The Inner Ring. We hope to put it on our website, but if not, you should just Google The Inner Ring and read it. Lewis explained that at every level of society, there are certain inner rings, groups, to which we could belong. It doesn't have to be a formal group. Students, artists, athletes, doctors, nurses, lawyers, musicians, whatever. You see these inner rings all around you, these little groups, places where you can say we and us. It's really one of the most dominant forces in life, and it can become... Um, an evil force if you desire to enter this ring and you sacrifice everything to do so, or if you're petrified in fear that you will never get in. Now, we have to have special relationships in life. Inner rings are not necessarily evil. Uh, we have to have confidential discussions, and you have to have leadership meetings and um, you know, there, there just are inner rings, but something can be innocent, a necessary part of life, but the desire for that something can be evil. Lewis said, a thing can be morally neutral, and yet the desire for that thing can be quite dangerous. Sometimes we become obsessed with entering a certain ring, whether it's at work or in our social lives, or at school, or wherever, <clears throat> we become envious, we become even manipulative, we, we say and do things we would never say and do, just to be in. And it becomes a driving ambition to get inside this group. And we fear the devastating consequences of being excluded but what's happening is that we're sacrificing so much. And in the meantime, it could damage your work and your friendships and your marriage and your church. Lewis says this. He says, you'll be drawn in, if you are drawn in, not by the desire for gain or ease, but simply because at that moment, when the cup is so near your lips, you cannot bear to be thrust back again into the cold outer world. It would be so terrible to see the other man's face, that genial, confidential, delightfully sophisticated face turn cold and contemptuous, to know that you've been tried for the inner ring and rejected. And then if you are drawn in next week, it'll be something a little further from the rules. And next year, something further still, but all in the jolliest, friendliest spirit now, it may end in a crash, a scandal, or even prison, or it may end in millions and public success, but either way, you will be a scoundrel. The irony is that once you make it into these inner circles, these inner rings, you'll find that there's, there's another inner ring to long for, to strive for. It's like peeling an onion and 
If you're actually able to do that, when you finish, there's nothing left. When you give up everything to be admitted to this either formal or informal society, you find that this inner, inner circle, this inner ring has kind of lost its magic. This initial rush of excitement simply doesn't last and you start looking for another inner ring or inner circle or exclusive group. And that's the whole point of these inner rings, to include some people and exclude other people. The invisible line, Lewis says, would have no meaning unless most people were on the wrong side of it. Exclusion is not accidental with these rings. It is the essence. It's quite a speech, very powerful speech for those students. And it made me think that this may be the best way for us to understand what John means by the world. You see, we all want to be accepted. I mean, all of us. We want to be liked. We want to belong. We want to fit in. We want to have this group that we're a part of. And I don't think that's wrong in and of itself. But what John's going to tell us is that there is a system of inner rings that has already rejected Jesus. And we may find it will reject us too. And then this can cause a lot of tension and anxiety because we want to be in these groups, but we want Jesus too. And it's like, these don't always go together. Some things in life, I think, are very gray and nebulous and, you know. Then some things in life seem to be more black and white. And John makes it clear that anyone who rejects Jesus as the unique divine son of God cannot have the life that God offers so I think for us, we need to settle this. We need, we need to, especially those of you who are young, you need to decide once and for all, where is my core identity? Where is my allegiance, my loyalty, my spiritual citizenship? Where is my home? Once and for all, who are we? So when we turn to 1 John 5, we're going to pick up in verse 4. And the first thing I think John wants us to see is that our faith in Jesus has conquered the world. This is a, a really odd way of saying it. He says this, this is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. Who is the one who's conquered the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, by the world, he's not talking about the physical environment, which is Amazingly beautiful this time of year. Crazy how, how beautiful fall is. I love it. He's talking about a system of people with values and beliefs and commitments that are openly hostile to God. He's talking about sinful humanity and rebellion against God. That's what he means by the world. It's, it's, this, it's a whole system of sort of diabolical inner rings and more. And I think as Christians, sometimes we're, we're trying not to be, um, not to put people off to Jesus by just being, you know, stupid people. You know what I'm saying? We, we don't want to raise obstacles unnecessarily. But that can drift into us trying really, really hard to fit in. And we begin to feel these inner rings, these systems of beliefs and values hostile to God closing in around us, almost like we're drowning. But John says, our faith in Jesus has conquered the world. This word conquer is very powerful. It's used over and over in Revelation um, for overcoming, for victory. It's, the Greek word is nikao, and I don't usually say Greek words because yeah, there's just no point in it, but it sounds like Nike. Nike is the Greek goddess of victory, and this is where this word comes from. And John says, our faith has nike the world. It has overcome, it has conquered the world. It has gained the victory over the world. Not just we will win one day, but we have already won. We have already defeated this whole system of inner rings. 
We've overcome this. It's not up in the air. I think, you know, half a century ago when Lewis talked to these young adults, uh, what, he was at, what he was in essence saying is unless, unless, the, unless you break it, the quest for these inner rings will break you. And we break it, we overcome it through faith in Jesus. As a result, we end up in an inner ring, the only one that matters. This one, the people of God, what John calls fellowship. Our faith puts us, numbers us among God's people. We belong. But this is not an inner ring where we exclude people. We want people to put their faith in Jesus and join this inner ring. Way back at the very first of this letter, John put it this way. He said, that which we've seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his, with his Son. <clears throat> so we enter this ultimate inner ring of fellowship with the triune God and his people. And notice that it's, it's not a membership that re results in prideful exclusion. It's one that makes room to invite others to put their faith in Jesus too. We proclaim to you so that you too can have this fellowship. So our faith has conquered the world, the system of inner rings, you might say. Rhetorically, I would just ask, how is, how is that going for you? You know, I think as a young professional, it's where this was the most enticing for me. You, you, you just so desperately wanted to be in. And sometimes that can cause you to strive and to do things that you wouldn't normally do just to get in. And I think what John's saying is you're already in. You're in the fellowship. You're, you're numbered among God's people. You belong. Your allegiance and your identity are already settled. Our faith conquers the world. And John says, our faith rests on what God has told us about Jesus. The second thing, and really the, the large section in the middle is, we can believe God's telling us the truth. Look at verse 6. Jesus Christ, he's the one who came by the water and the blood, not by water only, but by water and by blood. The Spirit is the one who testifies. The Spirit is the truth. There are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Are you confused? What in the world is he talking about? <clears throat> well, let's back up. I think every human being has to decide who's really telling him the truth about the world, what it is, what's wrong, how to make it right, who, who are we, where do we fit, who's telling us the truth. And Christians have decided that God is telling us the truth. I love the way Eugene Peterson sets this up. He says this, the usual biblical word describing the no we say to the world's lies and the yes we say to God's truth, the word is repentance. It's not an emotion. It's not feeling sorry for your sins. It's a, it's a decision. It's deciding that we have been wrong in supposing we could manage our own life and be our own God. It's deciding that we were wrong in thinking we had or could get the strength, education, and training to make it on our own. It's deciding that we've been told a pack of lies about ourself, our neighbors, and our world, and it's deciding that God in Christ is telling us the truth. The spirit, the water, and the blood testify. That's a really strange way to put it, but John loves symbolic language. We know the spirit refers to the Holy Spirit, what about water and blood? Well, most likely, I think, and you're welcome to just read all the commentaries about this <clears throat> or just take my word for it, either way. But most likely, I think the water refers to Jesus' baptism where the Spirit descended, the Father spoke Old Testament Scripture announcing to everyone that Jesus was the unique Son of God. 
And the blood probably refers to the cross where Jesus, the Son of God, died for our sins. What does this mean? It means that God has told us the truth, but not, not in a way we couldn't verify. God's testimony is not based on emotion or hearsay or experience or even tradition. It's based on what God has done in history. Jesus Christ came into this world. He was baptized. He died on a cross as our substitute. He took our sins. He offers us forgiveness. And then God said, I'm going to raise him from the dead to let you know I've been telling you the truth all along. So picking up in verse 9, John says, if we accept human testimony, God's testimony is greater because it's God's testimony that he's given us about his son. The one who believes in the son has this testimony within himself. The one who does not believe has made God a liar because he's not believed in the testimony God has given. John's repeating himself over and over and over. Verse 11, this testimony is... This is it. This is it. God has given us eternal life. The life is in his son. If you have the son, you have life. If you don't have the son, you don't have life. So God and this world system are telling us two different stories. What I'm telling you from Scripture this morning, based on what God has done in history, is that God's version is the true version. Our faith in what God has done is actually an act of rebellion. <clears throat> you guys want to be rebels? Believe in Jesus. That's the most rebellious thing you can do in our culture. Faith is actually an act of rebellion against a rebellious world. We've decided God's telling us the truth, and we rather believe God than this world system with its inner rings that will never let you find what you're looking for. We trust, we believe, we have faith, we accept God's testimony as the true story. And this truth brings us into a relationship with the truth. It's personal, capital P. Truth is a relationship. If we have the Son, we have eternal life. <clears throat> eternal life. You guys have heard that your whole lives, right? If somebody asks you to define that, isn't it a little hard to define, or is it just me? It's like, well, you know, I've always had kind of a hard time getting a handle on it. I mean, you could go with the King James Version, which says everlasting life, which just means life that goes on forever. But I think eternal life implies a little something more, a different quality, a different kind of life, maybe. Maybe some combination of those, but... It's always been hard to kind of penetrate my mind. Eternal life, what does that really mean? It's a very common phrase. And I was reading the other day in John's Gospel, and I read the story in John 11, and Sam's going to read this for us in just a second. But Jesus' friend dies, Lazarus. They were really close. Probably he was closer to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus than anybody else besides his disciples. And so Jesus enters this massive grief, um, and, and he decides he needs to do something about this. He's, he's mad at death. He's angry at death because death has taken away his closest friend, one of his close friends. But he's also overcome with grief. I, I like to think of Jesus as grieving mad. But he has the power to change things. And I want you to listen as Sam reads to, to that episode, and then we'll see what this tells us about eternal life. John 11. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, 
see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Thanks, Sam. You can imagine Lazarus coming out, and he's just completely wound up, you know, and he doesn't know what to do. He can't go anywhere. He can't, you know, mumbling, you know, what, what's... But Jesus, he shows up, and he's just mad. And once, once he starts acting, he just delivers this, this list of commands. If you read that passage carefully... And the last one is Lazarus, and, and literally it reads, Lazarus, here, now. And he shows up. His good friend was dead, been dead for several days. Death angered Jesus. It took away this, this close friend. It hurt him. It hurt his family. And Jesus is just fed up, and he intervenes. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a foreshadowing of what he's going to do for all of us on the last day. Brings him back to life. And I think I was reading this and then it hit me. I realized life isn't just something Jesus gives. Jesus totally and completely defines life. He is the eternal life. Jesus is the life, the way, the truth, the life. The greatest inner ring ever, people of God, is a life-giving ring. John 17, 3 puts it this way. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you've sent, Jesus Christ. It's, it's knowing God. It's having this relationship. It's, it's personal. It's a relationship. It's, it's having God live within you by his spirit. It's believing in God the Son to have this relationship with him, with this eternal life. And it, it lasts forever. So eternal life is, is a person. Our faith in Jesus has conquered the world, and we believe God's telling us the truth, and this truth is a person. And in verse 13, John wants to make his final point. He says, you... You can know that you have this relationship. Don't be rattled by the inner rings that are pressing in on you, enticing you. John says, I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. God's been telling us this morning through his word some pretty powerful things. It's almost like it's too good to be true. But this word for the Lord is meant for his people, for those who believe. And God's saying, I want you to know something. I want you to be confident about something. I want you to know that you know that you know. I don't want you to just be floundering in, in doubt and suspicion and tentativeness. I want you to know that you have the eternal life in Jesus. I think this is one of the things we can be confident of. If you know Jesus, the eternal life. You can know that you know him. If you've entered into this relationship, you don't have to doubt that you know each other. The confidence is real. So the insecurity and the doubt and the uncertainty, those are not from the Lord. They're a bunch of lies. We don't have to be like a bunch of bubbles that are just floating around and blown around by the wind. You can belong to the only inner ring that really matters, the people of God. 
100% confident that God's telling you the truth. One final thought today, it's from John 17 again. As Jesus is talking on the night before he goes to the cross, he says something that ties into all this and I think just sort of undergirds everything, supports everything. He says, and he's praying, he says, you know, I'm praying that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me as you have loved them. You ever notice that? That little word as is, a, is an adverb of comparison, just as. The God of this universe loves his son in the same way he loves us. He loves us the same way he loves his son. So by faith, we've conquered this, this system of inner rings. We belong to the Lord. We've settled this. We're part of this group. We don't have to continue striving and searching. God's telling us the truth. What he's done in history, the baptism, the cross, the giving of the Spirit reassures us that he's being truthful. Eternal life is a relationship with the living God. It's the eternal life that we experience in this relationship with Jesus. And we know that God loves us and knows us just like he loves his own son. That's life. That's the only inner ring that matters, you guys. I want to pray for you. And if you uh, would want to just repeat my prayer, um, just to yourself or even out loud, it's just a, a prayer that we would kind of get all this. There's some heavy stuff today with not so much... Um, you know, too difficult to understand, but just, wow, believing this and living this and, and embracing this. So I want to pray for you. Father, I pray, first of all, that we would realize that you love us perfectly. So we would confess, God, thank you for loving me perfectly. Thank you for loving me like you love your own son. Thank you that you have given me eternal life in the son, the eternal life. Thank you that I can trust you completely. Thank you for telling me the truth. Thank you that I can know that you're telling me the truth. Lord, because I'm loved, I'm in. The search is over. I belong. I can rest in your love. I can even risk loving others. I have nothing to lose. I can follow you with my whole heart, with all my energy and all my resources.